happens to women, what happens to our children, what happens to infrastructure, whether minorities and elderly people continue the right to vote. Everything that we have fought for, progressive folk have fought for for 100 years is at stake in this election, from the tax code to voting rights to our rights to control our conception. I mean, that, it's our election. And Katie said something earlier. This is really hand-to-hand, door-to-door combat. I mean, the media, um, the commercials will be there, but I do believe that it's our responsibility to go out to Florida, to go out to Ohio, and really talk through the issues. People are bombarded with media. The fact is that there will be another, there will be $3 billion. This is a, spent on this election, an amount that is greater than the GNP of many countries in the world. And people are, you know, inundated with the machine gun staccato of information. It's that door-to-door work that Katie and others are doing that really makes a difference. So those of us in this listening area in Chicago really should think about, if you can, if your work life or your schedule allows, thinking about taking that trip to Florida, taking that trip to Ohio, taking that trip to Wisconsin for the months. I was so. thinking about going to Iowa, but I like the Florida. The Florida one. is better. <laughs> I have to admit. But I, I want to say I think it's really important that uh, I too had been in Iowa coming through uh, after I was chasing uh, my son's band around. And uh, it was actually, uh, I did get people who were really good on Obama and I got people who just didn't seem to know what had gone on and said, I don't know about this health care. So it, and it's the kind of thing that uh, all three of us have, who have been community organizers at certain times in our lives know that, that people... Uh, you can bring people through changes. You can help them clear up the, the contradictions in their lives, and you can uh, basically point them in a better direction. And I think that now is the time for anyone who can give up uh, a day, two, three, a uh, couple of times during a month uh, to go to Iowa, to Wisconsin, to Ohio, to Indiana, even Florida. That's really important. Florida looks really good about that first week in November, the end of October. So the the there's a couple of pieces. Um, I'm going everywhere in my mind. I'm looking at your uh, talking points and uh, some things that we wrote up uh, that we all have been assembling so that folks can answer the lies. Uh, the energy that it takes to undo the lies is, I think, frustrating to people. Um, because, and uh, so I wind up, I, I love going to doors, knocking on doors for uh, a campaign because. Um, I never know what's going to come out of my mouth to these people. Uh, and four years ago, it came. It, it was something along the lines, this line that I finally got to with in Ohio was, um, so aren't we the greatest country in the world, or supposedly? So why don't we act like it? You know, and it, this would follow, um, you know, a conversation, and it would just get them. This time, it's like, you know what? When this president finishes his eight years, no one will be confused about how good a representative we had in that White House. No one will be, in, in fact, they'll be wishing they could get more of them. For those of you who know Katie from the heartland, Katie is also one of the country's best organizers. Oh. There's nobody, oh if I ever decide to run for office, which will never happen, <laughs> I would want Katie in charge of my There goes that job. Yet another job. Well, you got three the... people up here who maybe ought to run for office. Um, speak for yourself, John Aldrin. Um, that was the first play I was in. I know, I know you in, like back to in say New England. that. Um, Speak for yourself, there's also, John Alden. There's also an article that um, I, I've been passing out to people, which I just gave to Marilyn, published on the smirking chimp um, <laughs> called The Vanity of Perfectionism. Because one of the problems we have this time around, uh, four years ago there was a lot of energy, there was a lot of uh, vigor and excitement around Obama. Uh, it came from young people who had probably never... Uh, been political before or nev never been part of a campaign so there is an energy that carries it along it also came from uh, Obama himself and um, some of the things that he um, made people picture now I, I can be critical and say well I, that energy hasn't kept up from his end on the other hand I understand he's been doing a big job um, one of the people for example I talked to a woman on, on her porch the other day um, a returned Iraq war vet from the first Iraq war. And she's a big, tough girl, you know, not taking any guff. And she said, um, 
I really don't like uh, this notion of the president going around apologizing to other countries. And I, I interrupted her, I said, he wasn't apologizing for anything you did. He was apologizing because we, with some drone, killed innocent women and children, and he damn well should apologize. And I, for one, am glad to finally have a leader who, will, who has the cojones to own up. And she, she thought about that, you know. So I, I think there are a number of things. I mean, I think um, the, Obama, the Obama phenomenon uh, was created both by Obama, right place, right time, really started at the rally that you all were at in 2002 when Chicago became the first city, big city, to really oppose the war. Right. Um, but he was very clear then that he was not we. Right. No, he was not us. Exactly. exactly. One of the things that impressed me that day one was that he could speak on an international issue, but two, that he looked at a crowd of us, anti-capitalists, anti-war folks, and said, I'm not anti-war. I'm anti-stupid war. So I think a lot of what happened is that, and he was cl very clear also on uh, reproductive rights, that he didn't hold my position or yours. He said, I'm for reproductive rights, but I have feelings about limitations. Um, so he gets to office with really being the mirror for all of our hopes, dreams, and aspirations, some of which he fails. He's also president, not the head of SDS or, you know, or Democratic even the mayor of Chicago, of, right. of America. Um, right. The night of his inauguration, and I don't want to make excuses. I mean, there are things I disagree with with Me too. the administration and things both in terms of position. I, but I never expected him to do right. everything I wanted. And at the same time, we in the progressive movement fell apart. So you've got him caught between left and right oppositions. He did not solve the economy. And, and one thing that, speaking of amnesia, that it's really interesting to remember, it's not simply the Republican Party that got us into the, um, the crash of 2008. It was companies like Goldman Sachs, yeah. Bain Thank Capital, you. et cetera, yeah. whose unrestricted use of the tax code and these fancy things like derivatives, et cetera, that they made up during the um, late 90s and 2000s that brought on the, the tanking of the economy. So I find it very ironic that we've forgotten to talk about that, and right. we really need to because it's, we are in danger, and what we would do if the Republicans got elected is put the fox not only in charge of the hen house, but oh we would have God. opened the door and given them the opportunity to cook them and eat them really fast. It's really unthinkable. It, it, well, it is unthinkable. I mean, I think, I don't know, probably I said this at the last election. Um, it's a turning point. But mainly, so my other feeling about this election, you know, let us remember that this was not a landslide for Obama. 52-48 right. is four points. Right. And we are, in fact, a country divided. And we become further divided by our echo chamber media, that's true, but we're going to find out who we are as a nation, which I think has been something in question since we were kids organizing against Vietnam and against racism. Um, against the war in and Vietnam. And against the war and working with Fred and Hampton and others. Yeah. Well, Marilyn, uh, you Thank know, you. It's, uh, I've been trying to get you on the show for a while, and I know we can get you back more easily now uh, because you're having such a good time. And while you're still up here, uh, we're squeezing a lot into a short amount of time. I'd like to introduce Michael McCarty, who is uh, an old pal and um, yeah. is a member of the Illinois chapter of Black Panther Party from way back. And he's going to do a short story. Uh, and then we're going to bring up our next guest, Dennis Cunningham. So uh, Marilyn's sneaking out. Let's have another big round of applause for Marilyn Katz. And look for her in In These Times and the Chicago Tribune. She's something else. Marilyn, we, you got to promise to come back during this, uh, this uh, election period. And uh, maybe we'll make a trip to Iowa together, huh, girl? Okay. I would like that. She's for Florida. I'm going to Florida with you, Marilyn. Uh, Iowa. Iowa. Oop. Those okay, six Mike. electoral votes are going to be important. Michael, jump over into this chair so that the, uh, for those who get to watch this on uh, youtube.com slash Heartland Media. They can see my uh, handsome face. They'll be able to see you. Oh, yes. And I want to make one uh, announcement uh, that uh, some newfound friends of ours teaching over at the Newfield School are all over there doing volunteer work today, getting ready for all the kids in Rogers Park who are going back. So I just want to give a shout out to those people who I know are listening in. Yeah, that was, um, that's the ones who uh, made it out of our bar in time to be there. 
They were all in the bar yesterday, Michael. I know all the they teachers. were here. They were here just frolicking away and yes. uh, getting ready to have uh, said, good energy like teachers do. Tuesday, and we're really happy that we have so many wonderful teachers in Rogers Park in the public schools. And uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Okay, Michael McCarty. I said you got about five minutes. All Give right. us a great story, and then Dennis Cunningham, drink that coffee and get ready to come on up. <laughs> you are listening to the Live from the Heartland show, brought to you every Saturday over WLUW eight eight seven. Chicago Sound Alliance, and we are so happy to be here, and we do want to thank the Heartland Cafe, our kind of underwriter, for making it all possible, along with WLUW. Low these many years. All right. Here's Michael McCarty. Have mouth, we'll run it. Show sure enough. That's the truth. <laughs> Have mouth, we'll run it. <laughs> so I'm, up, um, I'm, uh, I'm in Chicago for the Fox Valley Storytelling Festival, where I'll be telling stories on Monday, and this is one of the stories that I'll be telling. I'll give you a Cliff Notes version of it. Um, I look for the uncommon story, the little known story. I look for stories that are inspiring, just like my man over there told that inspiring story about his inspiring book. And this is a story, the book is called The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. It's a children's book as well as an adult book. And here we go. William Kamkwamba was about 14 years old when drought hit Malawi, Africa. His family were farmers, and the drought came and they were wiped out, pretty much the entire country. The family could only eat one meal a day. He had to drop out of high school because they didn't have the $80 a year it cost to go to school. But he wanted to continue his education, so he went to a library that had been donated by some Americans. In that library, he found a book that talked about windmills. He learned that windmills could be used to generate electricity and pump water. And he thought, wow, we could have electricity in our home. Nobody had electricity in the village. We could pump water. That would take care of this drought problem. 14 years old, he decided to build a windmill. Now, there was no Home Depot, OK? So he had to go through people's trash and scrape together pieces of this old bicycle parts, old truck parts, plastic that he melted down. Meanwhile, the people in the village thought he had lost his mind. But he persevered. And he built, after a couple of failures, he built a windmill that was able to generate electricity for his family's home. All of a sudden, the people in the village were like, well, he's not crazy. We want some of that, too. People heard about this. People wrote about this. People came to write about it. And they heard about him. and. He was invited to talk at the TED conference. Now, what you have to understand is Williams did not speak much English. In figuring out how to do the windmill, he had to have a dictionary while he was going through it. So he said the first time he went up there for that TED conference in front of all those people, he said, my English, it left me. But he went on, and in fact, if you go online and Google William Kamkwamba or the book Who Harnessed the Wind, you'll see his second TED presentation where he rocked that sucker, okay? Well, word got out. He was able to go back to school, and he is now, I believe, at Dartmouth University studying engineering, and he has had more windmills built for his village. And you talk about somebody overcoming adversity over... Under, Obst obstacles and what have you, William Kamkwamba is the man. Ow. All right. Ow. <laughs> Big round of applause. Okay, we're doing a switcheroo. All right, Fox Thanks, Valley man. Storytelling Festival, Geneva, Illinois. Come on down. And that starts Monday. Hey. Is that on Monday, Michael? Michael, it Monday? it's Monday? It's Sunday and Monday. I'm on Monday. All right. Uh, Monday is the day to go. Okay. And now, we have another pal up here. <laughs> Actually, it was my first lawyer, uh, and I hope I don't need another lawyer, but if well, I do, I'm calling you. Uh, Dennis Cunningham. Dennis is a, Welcome, a, a, Dennis. a Chicago guy. He went to Loyola. Uh, I think he probably went to Loyola Academy, too, way back. Oh, no. No, no, no. Where'd you go to high school? New Trier. New Trier, all right. Uh -huh. Sorry, it, Dennis, I did that to you. That would be Don just Rumsfeld a bit too was Catholic. It was Rumsfeld was the guy you used to <laughs> run around with. And it it uh, oh, honed your skills in yeah, yeah. debate and arguing. So, How you doing? I'm okay. I've been vacationing. I've been in the country. I've been visiting family. I've been uh, tuned out 
Right on. Of all this stuff that uh, you've it's been talking about here. It's kind of nice to be tuned out, isn't it? It is. You yeah. know, I mean, you still got to go get the paper and do the crossword or something. But Yeah, but you can go right to the crossword. Yeah. Just, just Well, you're not old enough page. to have been at the Haymarket Rebellion. No, but not you quite. Do, you, do have, uh, you do have some knowledge about Labor Day. Give us a little... Uh, yeah, Labor for, the, for all the people listening, it is Labor Day. It's a wonderful day to celebrate organized labor. And uh, that's why we have a holiday tomorrow, and Dennis is going to just give us a little bit about a little bit of labor history. I guess, I guess you have to uh, respect it, but isn't it a phony substitute for May Day? Amen. It is. Huh? Amen. That's what we wanted to hear. That's it. It was, it was, isn't it one of those stars and stripes kind of <laughs> baloney cons that, you know, yeah, yeah. comes to... Actually, May Day, uh, the reason the we don't celebrate May Day so much is because Eisenhower made it Law Day, if you recall. <laughs> That's right. So right. we're bringing that, that back, though, too. I actually just got some film back that I finally had developed of the anarchist cheerleaders at a May Day demonstration about 10 years ago. That's good. That's, like that's good. It's, it's, you know, I mean, the truth gets lost. We tell it, it we tell it up here every May Day. We always tell it we always call it the original Labor Day in case people are confused. You maybe have to say it every Saturday. Might have to. 